Well, with snow on the ground this week, and here we are beginning the Christmas season. Christmas. Easter. <laughs> Easter, I guess. Mm. One of those seasons. But here we are with Easter. Lent began, and um, so we're moving up toward Easter, the resurrection of our Lord. And so I want us to take these Sundays between now and Easter and walk through that last week of Jesus' life. And so we want to do this all from the Gospel of Matthew, to just so we can stick with one Gospel, but it's recorded in all of them. And so we want to begin in the 21st chapter of Matthew's Gospel. This would be the chapter that's going to speak to us about what you and I know as the triumphal entry where Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. The people laid the palm branches on the road and they cried out, Hosanna. And they were shouting for us. They were saying, Lord, save us. Lord, save us. And that was a messianic statement. They were proclaiming that uh, Christ that Jesus was going to be the Savior of Jerusalem and the Jews, the Pharisees would rebuke him and say he needed to tell them to be quiet. And Jesus would say if they did, then the rocks would stand up and proclaim him to be Lord. So it is a time in which Jesus is openly identifying himself as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. This is for you and I an opportunity to openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Now we're hearing many rumors today and we're seeing on the news the truth that there are people that are losing their lives because they are standing up and saying that Jesus Christ is Lord. But the Bible says that these days will come and you and I are living in them today. And you and I must make the choice of what we're going to do. Are we going to stand on our two feet and say faithfully that Jesus Christ is Lord? I want us to, I'm in Matthew 21, but I tell you what, let's, you hold that and let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 11 and read the first verse this morning. Because the part of the triumphal entry that I want to talk to you about this morning has to do with faith. And you have to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse number 1. For it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In a nutshell, faith is the confidence in what is true. Faith is confidence. And what is true. So we must grasp what is true. And Jesus Christ has proclaimed that he is not only true. But he is the truth. And he's the way. And he's life itself. I need you to keep that in your mind. Jot it in your bulletin. That faith is is confidence in what is true. Because you and I are being told today to revisit what is true. And a matter of fact, we're even being told that what is true is only true to you. That it's only relative to your situation. And I want you to remember this morning as Christians that Jesus Christ came and stated truth for all of eternity. Jesus said he was here before the foundations of the universe. He will be here when it's all gone away. And that his word would stand forever. He is truth. And his truth is not relative. It's not just true in certain situations. He is true all the time and will be for all of eternity. We need to once again solidify in our thinking and our understanding that what God has spoken to us will stand the test of time, the test of fire, the test of trials. This word will stand. Now, let's back up to Matthew 21. And I want to pull out of this first day the little story that we read every year at Easter. 
And it is that story of Jesus speaking to a fig tree. I don't know if you've ever spoken to a fig tree. I grew up with fig trees at at our home. Uh, We had a brown one on one side of our house, and we had one that produced little yellowish-green figs on the other side of our house. And uh, my mother protected her fig trees uh, with fury. Uh, She did not like us climbing in them or on them. And we made fig preserves every year from them. In our story, we pick up in verse 18. It runs down through verse 22. I want to read that passage to you. And I want us to see the lesson that Jesus is teaching us. There's many pictures in these verses that we are going to try to pull out. And so listen as we read. It says, Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately, the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how? How did the fig tree wither away so soon? And so Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer believing you will receive. Jesus was taking his disciples to a place in religion that they had never been before. He was telling them to pray, to ask God for things, to have a a personal conversation with God in order to receive things, and this was not the way they had been brought up. This is not the way they had been raised. They had been raised that you take a sacrifice down to the temple, and you give it to the priest, and you tell him what your sin is, and the priest would slay the animal and sprinkle the blood at the altar and put some on the horns of the altar, and the priest would atone with the animal sacrifice for your sins, and that was the bulk of their religion. And Jesus has introduced to them a conversation with God that did away with the priest and opened the door to not only ask for their sins to be forgiven, but to ask for the needs in their lives. This was hard to believe. You mean I can go and talk to God myself? That's what Jesus was telling them. You mean that I can go and speak to him about my hardships or my needs? You mean I can talk to him about my life? This was totally new information to them. They had never worshipped that way before in all of their lives. And Jesus was telling them that they would need to express faith. They would need to put confidence in what is true. And Jesus, for three and a half years, has been demonstrating to them that He is true. That His words are truth. And these words stand for you and I today. Now, let's look at the idea of faith. Since the passage is about faith, Jesus clearly states for us that it's about faith. He tells us, if you have faith and do not doubt, Jesus did not doubt when he spoke to the fig tree, and it did exactly as he said for it to do. And Jesus has spoken to them and told them that they can live in the same type of environment, that they can walk in faith with God. It's, you and I need to relearn this lesson today. We need to relearn that it's not just the acts, the events, and the deeds that you and I do. But it is the God that we serve. So I want us to begin by going back to verse 19. And I want us to talk a little bit about useless faith. Useless faith. 
I've already stated that faith is confidence in what is true. So if we believe, if we have categorized as true something that is not true, then putting faith in that idea that we believe in only produces useless faith. Useless. So let's back back up and look at our passage this morning. It says that he comes upon the fig tree. Let me get into the original language here with you for just a moment because it's very important. When he speaks, and it says in verse 19, in seeing a fig tree by the road, the original language says that Jesus came upon a single, solitary fig tree. This was not an orchard full of fig trees. This was not a fig tree grove or hill or valley. Out there in the midst of everything that was going on between Bethany and Jerusalem, on the side of the road stands this single solitary fig tree. Now that's important to the story that Jesus is telling because as we go back to the Minor Prophets, we see that Israel is referred to it at times as a fig tree. Other times it's referred to as a vine, a grapevine. But Jesus is referencing the nation of Israel in the story that he is telling. This single solitary fig tree represents Israel itself. You see, Israel was the only nation that God had created by itself. He gave birth to the nation of Israel. He called a man by the name of Abraham. You know the story. He had a son named Isaac. And Isaac had Jacob and Esau. And Jacob had 12 sons. And from that came the 12 tribes of Israel. They were his people. And they were in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. And God drew them out. And the whole Old Testament is about God's nation and how he dealt with them. But they were God's people. There was not another nation in all of the world, and there's still not today, that God brought into existence for his own glory the way that he did the nation of Israel and that he has future plans for them they are not through with yet. The world thinks they can do Israel in. They will not do Israel in. Because Israel is God's people. And God has a plan for them and they will carry it out. So it's significant that Jesus speaks to this single solitary fig tree standing on the side of the road amongst everything else in the world. It represents the nation of Israel as it stands solitarily, singly, right by itself as God's nation that was to proclaim who God is to the world. And so he says to this little fig tree, it looks beautiful. Figs have great big leaves on them. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It's what Adam and Eve made their first garments out of. Now, wouldn't that make a fashion statement today? We're going to sew fig leaves together and make uh, garments for ourselves. There are two Bibles that have that gained popularity in the, about 400 years ago. And uh, one of them interpreted or translated the word garments as breeches. And it said in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve made breeches for themselves out of fig leaves. The other one said that they made aprons out of fig leaves. And that's the way they translated the garments, the clothing there. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Adam probably didn't want to wear an apron and Eve probably didn't want to wear breeches. And so, uh, but fig leaves, they go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. They were used to cover up the nakedness of the first sinners. And here we have a fig tree, and it is covered in leaves. And once again, it is covering up the sin that is underneath. You see, the nation of Israel was covering up its sinfulness. They were supposed to be the people of God. They were supposed to be righteous. They were supposed to be holy. 
But their outer garments, their outer covering, their temple and all of their robes and all of their Jewish ways, their, all of their laws, everything that they had added to God's Word, it simply covered up the sin that was within. And they put faith in the idea that all of their religious doings, their religious events, their religious activities, was what was going to get them to heaven. It was going to take care of them completely. The church demonstrates useless faith today when we build beautiful buildings. When we go through beautiful religious events and exercises to simply cover up the sin underneath that says we do not love the Lord our God with all of our hearts. The fig leaves said to anybody who walked by that little solitary fig tree, that tree has figs on it. The religious system of Israel said to all of the nations of the world, their temple and all of their religious exercises said that we know God personally and that we are righteous and holy. And in both instances, the fig leaves and the religious activities were covering up the sin that was underneath. My friends, I do not want you to exercise useless faith this morning I do not want you to believe in something that is not true I do not want you to put faith into religious exercises thinking that they are the substance of your salvation when they are not it says that Jesus went to the tree and there was no fruit on it at all nothing on it but leaves Nothing but covering. Nothing but fancy dress. And Jesus condemned the fig tree and said, You will never bear fruit again. And it immediately died. Jesus is predicting for Israel what he just did for this fig tree. People were looking into Israel and they were looking for God and he could not be found. God had walked in and out of Jerusalem for the last 33 and a half years. He had come as a young boy. He had come as a child. He had come throughout his adulthood. And now he was there as the Son of God in all of his glory. And Israel still was rejecting God. And when you looked inside of their priests, their Pharisees, their Sadducees, the Herodians and the whole list, They were nothing but fancy leaves, fancy coverings, but there was no life inside. You see, life is in the fruit. John would later speak to us in John 15, and he would talk to us about bearing fruit, that the evidence that there was life in a plant would be the evidence of fruit. It would bear fruit. And he would say in John 15 that if a limb or a branch did not bear fruit, that God would lift it up and he would do away with it. He would cut it off. He does that today with you and I. Useless faith, though. All of the Jewish people had useless faith. They had faith in people wearing robes. They had faith in sacrifices that were not being done in in the right way. They had faith in activities. And Jesus said, there's nothing but death in you, Jerusalem. Nothing but death in you, Israel. And I am going to pronounce destruction upon you. Jesus did that some 40 years later. The Romans would come in and they would destroy the temple. They would destroy that what was there. And even to this day, it has not been rebuilt. It has not been redone. Because God said it won't be. 
until my plan comes back together. For 2,000 years, basically, we have witnessed the, the deadness of the Jews that Jesus pointed out to them in this passage. Deadness. The part about it that scares me the most, though, is when he looks at the church today. Does he see life beyond our clothing and our buildings? Or does he see barrenness as he does in this fig tree? How about in your personal life? What does God see? When he brushes aside your talents, when he brushes aside the way that you look, when he brushes aside your accomplishments in life, when he looks beneath the leaves and he looks at the heart of a man, which he said that he does, does he find life? The Bible tells us that if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that he would find love, he'll find joy, he'll find peace. Things like goodness and kindness and gentleness. He'll find self-control. And meekness. He'll find all kinds. Those are the type of things that the Spirit produces. And that's what He's looking for in our lives. And the question is, is that what He's... When He pulls back the leaves, is that what He finds? Because that's what He's looking for. And so Jesus takes this little fig tree, solitary, single fig tree, representing Israel, and He brings the curse of God upon it. And says, you shall no longer be the fig tree. You shall no longer because you have refused to bear life. The second thing that we see in this passage, the second aspect of faith though, is that he speaks to us about a feeble faith. There's always been a remnant that God has been able to rescue out of the nation of Israel. There's always been a remnant in the land of Christians who have believed and who have laid down their life. He tells us in verse 20, And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? And Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Disciples, if you have faith, if you have confidence in what is true, not confidence in a lie, but confidence in what is true, and you do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed, it will be. Jesus said bigger things than this you can do when you believe the truth. But their faith was feeble. They saw Jesus raise the dead. Remember, this is just a few days before he dies. They had seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. They had seen him raise the young boy in the funeral possession through town. They had seen him walk on water. They had seen him feed 5,000. They had seen him heal those that were sick of everything from limbs that did not work to mouths that did not work to ears that did not work to eyes that did not work. You name it, they had seen Jesus wipe it away with a word. And now he speaks to a fig tree. And says, you shall die because there's no life in you, no fruit in you. And they stand back and they marvel. And say, how could he do this? You and I read these passages and we step back and marvel. This should have been nothing to them. To see Jesus speak to a fig tree. And it wither. He has spoken to the wind. And told it to stand still. And it stood still. He has spoken to the waves of the sea. And told them to lay down flat. And they laid down flat. And now he speaks to a solitary fig tree. And they're all amazed. The disciples demonstrate for us the feeble faith. Of not having confidence in what is true our faith becomes so small we doubt 
as the disciples doubted. I mean, what? it wasn't a big deal. I could have went out there with my pocket knife probably and taken a little while and chopped the fig tree down. I mean, I could have done that physically. I could have killed a fig tree. I couldn't stop the wind or calm the waves or raise the dead or heal the sick, but I believe I could, I believe I could chop down a, an old fig tree. I could do that personally and physically. Jesus simply speaks to it. And they stand there with all of this vast experience of Jesus and his miraculous power. And in their feeble faith, they still struggle to believe that he is God. I feel like that this is where many of us as believers today are. We're in the feeble faith ground. We've seen God heal us from fevers and infirmities and flus and colds and the list could go on to cancer to you name it and we still stand amazed when God does something else we've seen God save the lost we've seen him rescue those that's been out in darkness and then we're still amazed and marveled when he does something so simple as bring a little child to an altar and they ask Christ to, be sa to save them. Feeble faith. Our faith does not seem to be consistent from day to day to day. It seems that we're taken off guard when God works outside of this world. And yes, that who, that's exactly who he is. A God who is outside of this world. Feeble faith. It's demonstrated outwardly, outwardly that there is righteousness in our lives, but inwardly it says there's nothing here. There's no belief here. There's no trust. There's no confidence in Jesus Christ. I believe our lives are weak. I believe they're stricken by suffering and pain because we are a people of feeble faith. We've seen God. We've seen him save our own souls. We've seen him take what we own and multiply it. We've seen him work miracles in our own lives. And yet we stand amazed at something that he does that seems so simple. God was not asking for feeble faith. He was asking those disciples for something more. I believe today that God is asking each and one of, one of us as individuals for more than useless faith. More than fig leaves to cover up our sinfulness. More than good works to cover up our sinfulness. I believe he's asking for more than feeble faith. Feeble faith that just stands in amazement when somebody walks the aisle or a child gets saved or God provides a building or whatever he, he does for us. Feeble faith. Thinking that that's so amazing when it's just God is so much greater than fig trees, my friends. Fig trees. So he moves us to what I believe Christ would categorize as great faith because he speaks to it in verses 21 and 22. He says, I say to you, if you have faith, if you have confidence in what is true, if you have confidence in God, and you do not doubt, you do not disobey, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. You see, great faith that he's speaking about is demonstrated outwardly in our righteousness. But it's demonstrated inwardly in our obedience. You see, faith is basically the demonstration of what we believe. Faith is the demonstration of what we believe. Faith is more of an action than it is a thing. 
We have faith in something like doctrine, the teaching of the Word of God. We have faith in Jesus Christ. And if we believe what He said, and we believe what He says to us today, then we obey it. And if we obey it, we are demonstrating that we believe it. Faith is the demonstration of what we believe. Now folks, we have a tendency to always do what we believe. We have that tendency. So we put faith in what we think is true. And God said it's not about what you and I think is true. It's what he says is true. And this is where the hardship comes. Can I lay aside my experiences and my belief in the things that I've seen? And can I demonstrate faith? Can I be obedient to the things of this book? Faith. The demonstration of what we believe. Now let's put a few more pictures with this story. The fig tree is Israel. Jesus has come to bring the judgment upon Israel. He said that. I did not come to bring peace. I did not come to be a king. I came to bring judgment upon Israel. Jesus is judged for the sins of the world. Israel has rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And the gospel explodes out of Pentecost and goes from the Jewish nation to the four parts of the world today. And 2,000 years later, the Jews have been left in the dust and the Gentiles have rushed after the gospel with all that's within them. And what began as the fulfillment of Judaism has now been given to the Gentiles, to you and I. And the Jews are still trying to gather around a broken down wall in Jerusalem and put prayer slips of paper with prayers on them in the wall, thinking that that's what they need to do, and it makes them look righteous, and it's good-looking fig leaves when the news films them. When Jesus said, you just need to come and talk to me. You just need to come and talk to me. But let's get down to moving mountains for a moment. Fig trees you and I can chop down. You and I can handle small things like fig fig trees. But you and I can't handle mountains. They're just a little bit more than what we are physically able to do. Remember we're still talking about a spiritual event here. And Jesus Christ has come to reveal God to them in the flesh so that they might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. John would write the book of 1 John, the epistle, and he would go into lengthy dialogue there that if they did not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, then they can be none of God. He goes into great great work to try to explain to them that this is the great mountain that needs to be removed. Jesus came to earth as God in the flesh and they that was a mountain to people. How could God leave heaven and come and dwell in human flesh and walk upon this earth and die for my sins, be placed in a tomb, and be raised from the grave and live forever, that was a mountain that was far too big for them. And Jesus tells them in this passage that if you have faith, that if you have confidence in what is true, then you can move that mountain. The nation of Israel couldn't move that mountain. They saw him literally in the flesh. Jesus would say that there was prophets who who longed to see that day but didn't get to see it. That these people were especially blessed because they got to see God in the flesh. But it was a mountain so big that it caused them to doubt. And the Jews could not grasp and believe 
that Jesus was the Son of God. It's a mountain that still stands today. It's a mountain that is not removed by good works or by hard work or by digging or by a lifetime of devotion to moving mountains. It is a mountain that is only moved by faith, by having confidence in what is true. Confidence in the fact that Jesus is the Son of the living God. It's still the big mountain in all of religion today. When the religions of the world gather and speak with Christian people today, we are told over and over and over again, if you would set aside one thing in your religion, we could get along in harmony. And the one thing that we are asked to set aside is this belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Therefore, He is the only way to heaven. If y'all would just give that up, then all the religions in the world could coexist, as the bumper sticker says. But my friends, that's the great mountain. That's the great truth. That's what makes us the single, solitary fig tree. Is the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the living God. And He's the only way to heaven. Now the church is the fig tree that's standing there today for me to play out our picture for us today. And God needs to know if there's any fruit among us. I've already told you what Galatians says that fruit should be. We still think it's fabulous works. Monstrosity buildings, I guess you could say. Crystal cathedrals. And the list goes on. And yet Jesus says, when he had Paul to write to the church at Galatians, that that's not what he was looking for at all. He tells us in Galatians chapter 5, I want to read it to you in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. When Jesus pulls back the clothes and the buildings and all that's inside, he's wanting to see love in this building among us. He's wanting to see if there's joy. He's looking for peace. He's looking for long-suffering. He's looking for kindness. He's looking for goodness. He's looking for faithfulness. He's looking for gentleness. He's looking for self-control, and he states that against these fruits, there is no law at all. This morning, I need you to look inside your garments, your religious garments, your denomination, your church house, and what do you see? What's underneath the leaves? That make you look so alive and so colorful and so beautiful and so attracting. What's under those leaves? Do we find the fruit of God as listed in Galatians? Because that's what we're supposed to produce. That's what God produces in our lives. Any other fruit we've produced on our own. And God says to us, I need you to have confidence in what is true and don't doubt it. I need you to have confidence in the fact that Jesus is the only Son of God and never doubt it, he says. Because you're always going to be like me. You're going to do what you believe. 
And if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God, then my friends, you will not produce this fruit. You'll produce something altogether different. This is Easter season that we're starting into. And Jesus begins with a very difficult story for us. It's a story of self-examination. It's a story of parting ways with that which is of this world. It's a story of us putting on righteousness and holiness. It's a story of us exercising faith of us exercising obedience to what is true. Now let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as Sharon comes to prepare.